Hello, Darren. Bradley, great to see you. How are you? Good to see your friendly face again. Very well, thank you. Yourself? Indeed, yeah, doing really well. Excited for today, so I appreciate you uh, joining us. Good, man. We've got a great agenda. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, same here. Well, I think it's about that time. Um, what do you say we just uh, kick things off, shall we? Let's do it. Nice. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm going to start things off today. Um, we're running this webinar. Uh, my name is Darren Jennings. I'm the chief com commercial officer here at Speak App. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is the real ROI of effective frontline employee training. And I'm positively delighted to be joined by Bradley Hunt. Uh, Bradley, why don't you, you introduce yourself to the uh, attendees today? Certainly will do. Thanks, Darren. So my name is Bradley Hunt. Uh, I lead our go-to-market efforts here across uh, Rest of the World here at Edgemy. So helping prospects and potential partners, uh, helping them really build out uh, business cases to justify their investment in frontline training tools. So I'm really looking forward to, to be here. And it's worth saying that we're experiencing mini, uh, mini heat wave here in London. So it's great to be able to be talking about a hot topic that's on the lips of all of our prospects and clients today. Uh, great. I love the pun as well. That's, uh, that's a very, very topical. Uh, well, and, and you're absolutely right. It is a hot topic. Uh, everyone is, is out there fighting for budget, fighting for priorities uh, for their particular line of business. And uh, sometimes those things can be obscured. So I, I'm really interested in, in the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, before we jump in, um, just maybe a bit of a background on, on the organizations that are that are here represented. So as I mentioned before, uh, I'm Darren Jennings. I'm with an organization called Speak App, and, and we are a frontline employee experience platform. Now, fundamentally, what that means is that frontline workers, uh, we define those as those folks that are not sitting behind a desk. They are out in the front lines in your construction uh, sites. They are on the manufacturing floor. They are serving guests in, in hotels and in restaurants. Uh, they're, they're picking packages. These are the folks that are doing the hard work out there. And oftentimes, for too long, they've been left out of that conversation. So what Speak Up aims to do is to provide them with an experience that is going to be more exclusive, right? <laughs> inclusive, efficient, engaging, and interactive. And we do that primarily through brand and mobile apps. Uh, and we're really excited today, uh, of course, with our partnership with Edgemy, but but also really interested about uh, about Edgemy. Maybe tell a little bit to our attendees what, uh, what you've been up to, Bradley. Certainly. So Edgemy's mission is to help everybody uh, be successful at work. And we have a core focus on the frontline workforce. So by delivering immersive social media style training within the tools frontline workers are already using, workers are able to access and consume immersive social media style training in the flow of work that directly improves their performance. And our clients have deployed Edgemy across a range of use cases and industries, which has led to improvements across workforce metrics such as productivity, quality, retention, and safety, all of which lead to tangible ROI, which we'll dig into today. Fantastic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Such an important topic. Uh, so in terms of today's agenda, uh, we're going to start with just the basics of, of why are we struggling to measure ROI? And Bradley and I have a nice little repartee about that. We'll jump into what are the impacts of this at both the micro level and taking it a bit higher level at the macro, getting very, very specific by digging into those four aspects of how to maximize ROI through optimized frontline training. Uh, and then we're going to go through an actual use case and a case study about discovering the real ROI of effective frontline training. Uh, so we're really, really excited about this today. So Bradley, I, I guess we'll just kick things off. Um, you can see from the slide that you know, more than a third of HR and learning and development professionals are struggling to provide ROI on training when they're speaking to their finance teams to justify that expense, as you pointed out, which is honestly really baffling to me. I mean, uh, of course, we could always ask the question of you know, what, what happens if we do nothing? What if we don't train them? What are the negative impacts to the business? And, and that's a fair point. But it really should be easier to prove ROI uh, to, on training to the finance team so we can actually continue to fight and, and get the budget that we need to provide better, better outcomes for our business and for the, the, business, uh, the people that we serve. So, so in your mind, uh, Bradley, what do you think? Well, why are we struggling? Well, that's where we're here to help, and you're absolutely right. So measuring ROI, it's a common problem faced with prospects we speak to. And if you move to the next slide, Darren, there's three common challenges that we see time and time again when measuring training ROI. So the first one is we have no training data. This is often because in-person training is the only training modality being used. And for the record, we aren't anti-in-person training whatsoever. It's actually a vital part of any training program. However, if you're doing everything offline, you're very much in the dark because the data is untrackable, right? So what you can't measure, you can't act on. So challenge number one is not being able to log any data whatsoever. The second challenge is data is often siloed or incomplete, and they're actually missing pieces of information. 
And this problem tends to be because not much consideration has been given to the systems being used. And instead of having them speak to each other and work in tandem, which might seem obvious, such as combining shift scheduling and employee engagement tools with training, these are all separate softwares living in different places, and they might not even be accessible to employees on the same devices. So from an admin perspective, your data now exists everywhere, and the time investment in crunching and combining these disparate uh, data sets is huge, especially for one L&D, uh, one person L&D teams. And then finally, obviously, the key reason why we're here to speak is they don't know how to map training impact to business KPIs. So things are being measured, but there's never been a process involving other stakeholders, stakeholders to strategically align training impact to business objectives. You might even not really be sure what the downstream impact of increasing your training engagement or completion rate would be. And challenge three, I guess, is exasperated by the fact that business KPIs are so unique and variable, right, particularly by industry. For example, we hear time and time again in retail that it's sales that they're looking to increase, whereas in hospitality, that might be food safety, food, sorry, foods, uh, health and safety and compliance. And then in manufacturing, we often see uh, plays towards efficiency as well. So on slide eight, this obviously leads to both some consequences, but for, for both employees and the business. And on slide nine, we can actually have a look at the flip side of admin struggling with siloed incomplete data. There's an employee struggling with access to training or failing to extract value from the training that they're being given, which is a real problem. One in three frontline workers are using four or more apps in their, and digital tools in their workplace. And 91% are frustrated with work software. 57% even says that it makes them less productive and it's there supposed to be helping them. And what we found is this leads to three things, right? First up is absenteeism. Frontline workers are less likely to show up, and if they do, are not switched on on the job. And Gallup did uh, a lot of research on the subject of employee engagement and the cost of this. And according to their most recent State of the Global Workplace report, 62% of the world's workforce are not engaged, and 15% are actively disengaged. And I'll just read a direct excerpt here. Engaged employees are the engine that moves your organization forward on every level. Teams scoring in the top quartile on employment engagement saw the following benefits. 10% high customer loyalty, 23% higher profitability, 18% higher productivity in sales, and 18% lower turnover. Moving to the second issue here is increased likelihood of injury. The impact of this on the employee who becomes injured can obviously be huge. An injured employee bears about 30% of the total cost of workplace injury, which includes loss of income, pain, loss of future earnings and medical costs. And this is not counting like the social consequences and strained relationships and so on. Finally, lack of confidence to interact with customers. I've been there myself when I had one of my first roles in retail, uh, speaking to the general public. We know that We've identified that isolated lack of confidence to interact with customers specifically here, but this point could have easily been lack of confidence in general, which is something that can impact anything from customer experience in the case of retail and hospitality to on the job safety and construction and manufacturing. And our own proprietary research here at EDGME actually found that 83% of retail leaders worry about employees' ability to interact confidently with customers. And when we dig further about why that was, some of the quotes that came up were such as employees are afraid to engage with customers and employees aren't sufficiently skilled or lack relevant knowledge to do so. That is a staggering. I actually hadn't heard that statistic, Bradley, until you just mentioned it. But 83% of managers are, are, are worried that, that their employees aren't going to have the confidence to interact with customers. I mean, that is that is a shocking statistic. And you know, if, if we take it to the next level up, of course, you know, we're, we are seeing, as you pointed out earlier, that growing disconnect between higher level organizational KPIs and those that are specifically slated towards training KPIs. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think we really need to avoid that tendency to continue to separate them. And, and we know it's difficult as you as you uh, laid out quite earlier, this, the three challenges with, with achieving ROI, but we know that if we have a, a disconnect between what's happening with the training level and what's actually going on at the organizational level, then it's very, very difficult to connect those dots for the business leaders and also the folks that are here that we're trying to convince about the ROI. So, so we know that this leads to these these challenges you've just discussed. This is higher operational costs. I mean, it, the employee engagement value, I think, has been so discussed uh, and, and documented over such a long period of time uh, that it's almost, it, you don't even need to mention it anymore. But the, the challenge I think we find is you have to leapfrog from one, one KPI to the next. And all of this really means is that our costs are higher. We have lower profit margins. 
as you just discussed earlier, poor customer experience. If you don't have a really good re uh, interaction with a salesperson or somebody that that is trying to help you, uh, then that's not going to lead to a good customer experience. And it challenges that long term sustainability when when you think about people that aren't really skilled in their jobs uh, or they don't have the resources they need to feel competent and confident in their jobs, then they're not going to stay at the organization very long and you're going to lack that that succession and so that additional people can come in and, and continue to serve the bigger picture of the organization. Totally. And actually, when I first read that, um, the the percentage, 83% of retail leaders worry about employees' ability to interact confidently with customers, it takes me back to the second pain that we mentioned about data being siloed and difficult to find, or indeed having a total lack of data. You know, if you could see that somebody had taken an assessment that scored 100% or 90%, I'm sure that would give retail leaders a little bit more confidence. 100%. And to the to the point we're just making on this slide now, Bradley, is that that improves overall employee experience, doesn't it? Yeah. And I take this quite, I hear this a lot. And, you know, think about your own experience uh, in your career. Nobody wants to come in and be mediocre at their work. Yeah. Nobody wants to, to not feel that they have the, the, the training and the competency and the competence to do well. But if they do have that, that underlying uh, discomfort that they have is indeed going to lead to a poor employee experience and all of those negative impacts that we've had including um, lower profitability, lower retention, all of these terrible, terrible things. So we, we, we've certainly depressed our, our audience enough here, uh, Bradley. So <laughs> what do you say, how is it, that, what is it the, about the, the frontline employee experience and how is this relevant? So let, let, let's kind of really connect these two together. And, and so I, I really think it's important for us to, to understand the, the entire frontline employee experience. Um, so you think about uh, when they come in, they, you have this concept of the employee or employer value proposition, which is this is a, a, a sounds like a great place to work for me. Uh, this is where the organization is doing its recruiting. Then they onboard these new, new new folks with with some maybe some early training going on. But once they've been within the organization, and that could be on day one or it could be on, on year ten, there is a whole confluence of things that they need in order to do well. That's that's receiving information from my company. You know, I, I, I need to hear from my company from time to time. Yeah. I would like to communicate with them from time to time. Uh, I would also like to learn about what's going on, how to do my job, maybe even learn about ways I can, I can move to the next level. I need some support for operational elements, like what kind of tasks should I expect it to do? And of course, measuring some of those important outcomes. And, and, and sometimes people do move on from the organization despite having a, an exceptional employee experience. But I, I think one of the challenges that we see, certainly as it relates to this topic today, Bradley, is, is when you remove one of these components from employee experience, then the whole thing tends to fall down. Yeah. You know, if, if, you, if you take out that learning bit, then they're not going to have the competence and the confidence to do their job. And it doesn't matter how great your messages are, um, they're not really going to, uh, to do well, are they? And, and all of that is, of course, going to impact their bottom line. So that being said, let's now we can switch to the positive aspect here, Bradley, which is all right, how, how do we actually get how do we actually solve this challenge? What, what are some of the four aspects of maximizing our maximizing ROI? Good idea. So let's start with aspect one. So if you want to jump, yeah, perfect. So let's talk about aligning training with business goals, uh, which is obviously something we outlined a little bit earlier. And we have this what we refer to as a dollar impact framework. So the aim of the dollar impact framework is not just to get clear on the value training would deliver for your own benefit, but doing this will also set you up to make the case internally to show other key stakeholders the value of the investment you're pitching. So step one, this stands with a question, what is your current process and where is there an issue? For example, you might have a thorough in-person onboarding process that you feel really sets your people up for success, but you have no of reaching people reliably after you send them an offer and before they step on site for their first day. Anecdotally, I've spoken to quite a few retail managers where a new hire will make it all the way to the car park, believe it or not, and then turn around and leave because they lack the confidence around first day, week one expectations, the company's culture and values, and they don't know anything about the team they're joining, and the anxiety takes over. Now, by positioning the biggest problem trading would solve as the first step, you're actually in a position, um, the invest you're actually able to position the investment in training as a solution rather than a cost. So step two. Once you've isolated the problem, step two is to evaluate what business metrics changing this problem would impact. So the easiest way to map business metrics is to look at what metrics you already measure as a company and how do they ladder up to your departmental or company OKRs, taking the new hires, um, not showing up for their trial, trial or first shift, the metrics impacted could be no-show rates and obviously customer reviews. And then finally, steps three and four. So steps three and four look at what happens if these are negatively, positively impacted and the associated costs of doing so. So an increase in confidence equals fewer no-shows, 
equals you're no, no longer short staffed equals customer satisfaction improves right because people get served faster and the service ultimately improves this leads to more repeat customers higher spend per customer greater customer loyalty and as i say this it almost sounds a little bit obvious but it's really not when you're in, in the midst of it and from this you can attach a cost implication like increasing lifetime customer value and from there you can look at specific dollar figures so let's work through an example and map each step from the framework to metrics implications and dollar cost and on slide 17 we've got a problem statement uh, that we often hear from our retail partners so maybe of you watching this might be able to relate but i'll read it out we currently only have one computer in the break room to access training um, and associates have to leave the shop floor, turn the computer on, load the software and log in. This takes them away from work, disrupting productivity. It also prevents us from building a culture of learning, right? And the outcome is that employees are less customer confident and equipped uh, to deal with something such as theft. If we apply this dollar impact framework on slide 18, we can now tie this to business metrics. So when you have employees who are being interrupted to complete low quality training and don't feel empowered with knowledge to succeed, they're often unconfident, as we touched on a little earlier. And now the downstream impact of this can be on the amount of units they are able to sell. So that directly relates to number one, sales per employee. Also how customers perceive the business, so your brand reputation and ultimately branch customer ratings. And finally, the volume of inventory lost to theft, obviously speaking to shrinkage. And moving to slide 19, we can now associate some cost implications. So labor costs remain the same, but each employee generates less revenue, decreasing net profit over a period. Your reviews within store have gone down. And in the current climate, customers are more review conscious than ever, right? So now more than uh, spend is required. To, sorry, now more spend is required to gain a customer. And finally, there's less inventory for legitimate customers to purchase, giving you a smaller product pool from which to recoup the costs. And when we finally apply the dollar impact on the next slide here, so step four, thanks, Darren. Uh, what does this really mean in dollars? I'm going to take you through some sample figures. So number one, total revenue has gone down to $2 million. Wages have stayed the same at 250K. And net profit is now 486,000 versus what it once was, $686,000. As the cost of revenue has increased in relation to total revenue, Number two, you're having to spend more to attract the same amount of business, increasing your customer acquisition costs. You now spend $30,000 per month to attract the same 1,000 customers, increasing customer acquisition costs three times to $30 from when it was 10, which again costs $240,000 more a year than it did before. And shrinkage is made up of a lot of different things, but it, can, it could be return forward. It can be internal theft. And on average, it costs retailers around 1.3% of sales and shoplifting represents the largest share of losses from theft. So let's say you lose an average of $20 per shoplifting incident, and there were 10 incidents daily. That could have been lowered or prevented with relevant training, and that's $72,800 per annum alone. On the next slide, we return back to our problem statement. And to put things into perspective, we can contrast the problem statement with the dollar impact. So because it's harder for employees to access knowledge that will increase confidence in customer interactions and make them product experts, so their ability to sell improves, or indeed get them wise on dealing with things like theft to tackle shrinkage, you could stand to lose in excess of $500,000 per year. And seeing the problem against the dollar impact like this really gives you a sense of the ROI training can influence. Moving on to aspect two, let's speak about how delivering relevant, engaging content can help. So there really is a mismatch between training content and frontline needs. And we've hinted a bit as to why there's such an issue, but ultimately training isn't being delivered in a way that's suited to their demographic. Their working day looks completely different to yours or mine. And you can't share training in the way that it's expected to have an impact because, well, to get more specific, training is failing the front line because of two key reasons. One, it's not engaging. So it's text-based or can generic content. We know video is king, but not all video is created equal. And 67% admit to not paying attention to even a video. This is where the can generic part comes in. If you are watching the same five minute animation with voiceover, that every colleague of yours across the nation has already seen, is not personal to you. You have no stake in the material, and so it's less reason for you to give it your attention. And it's also about what the degree the learner is able to interact with the content. Are they able to interact with it or not? And is the learning experience passive? And are they likely to retain the information? 
Secondly, it's not continu continuous. Training is infrequent, can be confined to one-off events. It happens and as and when. And this is a problem because to be retained, knowledge needs to be repeating. In learning science, this is known as the forgetting curve. So what's the solution, I hear you ask, Darren? Moving on to slide 24, in our world here at Edgemy, we speak about delivering relevant, engaging content. So one key challenge of training uh, the frontline is maintaining connection with content. The content needs to be interesting enough for them to keep them there, hold their attention. It needs to be short. That's a given in today's world. But how else can you make it worth their while? A couple of tactics uh, for promoting the engagement is, number one, match the training format to the training objective. As mentioned, video is king, but a regular video isn't going to always work best for everything. For example, conflict de-escalation. You could get someone to watch a video, but seeing and doing are totally two different things. And this is where simulation-based training comes in. This allows the learner to walk through a true-to-life scenario, but in a risk-free environment. They control how the interaction plays out. It turns the training experience from passive to active, better preparing them for the real-world application. Or indeed, if you're trying to teach somebody a process, like a standard operating procedure or SOP, instead of using conventional video that shows the learner how to operate a forklift, by watching this, they obviously will likely be qualified to operate one, present the video in a different way, break it down step by step, and present them with a series of looping videos uh, per step. Each step has tech instructions overlaid, and the video keeps looping until they are able to carry out that next step, at which they can tap it and then move on. Very much like sort of following a recipe on an Instagram story, except it doesn't move on until you're ready. So there's just a couple of examples. Uh, I've seen the uh, the simulation training that you had mentioned on the Edgemy platform, Bradley, and it really is. It's, it's it, not only do you know more about it, but it's actually almost entertaining and engaging. It's it's actually really quite something. That's really impressive. Love you mentioned that. Yeah, the second part of it is so you've got the engaging training. The second part of it is relevance, right? We spoke about this a little bit earlier. If you're going to see generic content, it doesn't really appeal to you as the individual. So the second way of ensuring attention is held until the end of training content is making sure it's relevant to the person receiving it. It sounds obvious, but the more relevance, the higher the degree of engagement. And relevance largely happens on the back end of Edgemy. That is invisible to the learner, right? So training gets serviced in reaction to an input or around a set of criteria. For example, you have an employee logged as working a specific role in a specific location, content they're suggested relates to these things, or it can be event-based. Your branch receives a bad review, employee receives reactive training around this, and we support this with a feature called Smart Teams at Edgemy that allows administrators to give people access to training that is meaningful to them based upon their unique attributes. And this is the idea of delivering training in the flow of work. Completely agree. I think this is one of the most exciting elements of Edgemy that, that really caught Speakup's attention when we started discussing this partnership is, is because relevance of information for the frontline is so vital. And we, we approach it very, very similarly in terms yeah. of very targeted, hyper-targeted uh, training, but also content for them. For sure. Which kind of takes me takes me onto the topic that I wish to address now, which is really, it, it's more conceptual about really meeting employees where they are. I mean, so so far, we've talked about um, you know great content, engaging content, having relevance. That's all really really important. But but let's be fair. When we're talking about frontline workers in particular, there's there's often this desert of information, you, or, or desert of access to information. You, you described a scenario early on in your in your dollar framework about well, there's a shared computer. The associates have to go in, log in, load up the software, and do and do what they want. Uh, but if they're not, if they're not having access to information on their terms and a device that they have with them all the time, uh, then the best content in the world, the most relevant content in the world, is not really going to be useful for them because they don't really have a convenient way of accessing it. And as you can see from our lovely gift here, it is frankly <laughs> overwhelming. Great uh, choice. <laughs> thank you very much. So, so I think that first step is is we want to leverage the tools that we need, and and what we at Speakout specialize in is being that first stop destination for everything that your frontline worker needs in order to access information, comms, training, pay slips, and so forth. So we really want to bridge that gap between uh, training delivery and frontline needs by just meeting where they are and on the tools that they're using every day. So the concept behind this, of course, is. Um, having a single source of information, so in place for everything they need. So we, we know that they're going to come in and they utilize their speak up uh, application to access their pay slip or access their shift schedule, receive information from the manager about update. Um, all of these things can be latticed together in a very easy and seamless way so that we can promote this content to them. And, and I was thinking about this earlier. If you consider that 
Um, Seventy-five percent of you who are who are presumably on this webinar today are have, have mentioned that you sk struggle to schedule training as broadly as you mentioned before about the the fact that it's sort of ad hoc and it's, it's inconsistent or it's disparate or or worse it's canned content. But if you can allow them to access information uh, when it works for them and on their terms and on the device that they prefer without impacting the quality it's of that training itself, I mean now you really are starting to to build a magical experience and, and the power of a truly integrated platform. Of course, we, we, we want to make sure that this is a seamless workflow. And, and this is where I think SpeakUp really does a quite a nice job is, is layering in those training opportunities alongside the other information that, that they are constantly receiving. So they might receive a message from, from their manager about something going on at the shift today, or they might receive a task that they have to complete. And while they're completing that workflow, they can see there's an opportunity to actually complete that training. I think it's such, such a really important uh, part of this. So oh, I think in terms of the results, so when, when you meet employees where they are, we, we know the benefits of this about actually having engagement and communications and task management operations, all of these things around the employee experience we've just discussed. We know that the benefits of these things are so well documented, I, 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 I almost shudder to mention them again, but we see significant reduction in communication delays. I mean, how many times have, have organizations needed to send out an urgent message about, I don't know, there's, there's a spill in, in the manufacturing floor or there's been a recall or for a food item and they need to get that information out. Without a direct channel of that communication, they don't have the opportunity to do that. As a consequence, employee engagement scores suffer, training costs uh, start, are starting to not increase. Uh, sorry, the training costs will, will be reduced. You, you get to see some faster onboarding processes. Project completion rates, this is an interesting one that we see certainly in the construction industry where you have a, a better time to actually complete projects and, and move your employees from one project to the next. And of course, finally, decreased turnover, all pretty straightforward. But I think the next part is really just, um, yeah, great training is a powerful tool, but it really is one piece of that puzzle. And this is what we really want to underscore with our partnership with Edgemy is the vision of employee experience, as I described earlier, is people should always know where to go. They should have a single reliable first stop destination for, for any information that they need to do their work, whether it's getting in touch with their colleagues, getting in touch with their managers, learning about the leadership of the business, of course, learning about how to do their jobs well, learning about how to do that next level, conducting their work well, and then measuring that with all true workforce analytics uh, insights. It's such an important piece of the puzzle, and I really can't underscore that uh, enough here today. Now, I'm not going to read this. There's a lot of statistics here, and I know we want to get to the actual ROI case study here, Bradley. But uh, we we do know through Josh Bursch and company. I think you had highlighted a Deloitte uh, a report earlier, Bradley. But we know that anything from financial targets to customer satisfaction scores to retention metrics, a great place to work. All of these elements are significantly impacted by having an increased employee experience, where you see the intersection of communication, work, or insights, and of course, exceptional training. All right, here we go, Brad. This is this is the moment we've all been waiting for. So, what is the real ROI of frontline training? Great question, uh, and I'm glad you asked it. So, um, yeah, listen, I, I just want to wrap up and take a, a moment to share how we've calculated ROI for a transportation and logistics client. So, by delivering training in the way we've suggested, our transportation and logistics client were able to log a two point increase in productivity. Now, this might not sound like a lot. But we'll run, we'll run through why it was actually really impactful. So a key measure of operational productivity for them is how many parcels per person are processed through their warehouse, which they refer to as triple PH. Their frontline workforce operate in a very dynamic environment. So people are loading parcels onto belts, loading them off belts, looking for shrink wrap and maneuvering different equipment. The more highly skilled people are in each component of this, the better the whole process works together which is challenging when there's thousands of parcels and more than 800 people involved in the process. So this is very much an efficiency productivity gain use case. On the next slide, we'll break down the numbers. So let's say you've got 100,000 uh, parcels to process in a night. At 39 parcels per person per hour, you're going to need to use 2,564 hours of labor per night to process that. Now, if you can move the dial on productivity up by 2 to 41, your labor requirement drops to 2,439. So in one night, you've saved 125 hours of labor. That doesn't sound very much in isolation, but if you times that by the number of operating nights a year, which for this client is 252, 
then you've saved 31 and a half thousand hours over the course of the year. And it scales with parcel volume, right? So let's say we were processing at 300,000 parcels per night whilst being delivered. What you save by the same calculation ends up being 94 and a half thousand labor hours. So for this client, this ended up translating to a hundred and oh, well, almost $130,000 saving on a monthly basis, all from a two point productivity increase. And that's a, a uh, success story we're particularly proud of. You can find it on our website, on our social media channels as well. But I thought it was apt to uh, wrap up because it is quite a success story. Uh, it's actually astonishing. I remember we were discussing this when we were preparing for today's session and just thinking that, <laughs> yeah, so two two parcel per hour increase. It's probably not even noticeable by mm. by the people that are actually doing that work. But of course, as you scale onto it, it's significant. But, but what it struck me as well is that that is actual productivity efficiency that can be 100% captured by the business. Yes. And that's not always the case. You know, there could be some more nebulous concepts around productivity or ROI and various things. But but when you're looking at 31,500 labor hours that are recaptured per year, I mean, that is actually recaptured by the business. So that is actually a true ROI uh, that the business yes. can reap. Oh, yeah. and, and those savings are there to be repurposed, right? But you're absolutely right. When you're looking at a, uh, a two-point productivity increase in isolation as a line manager looking as an individual, it's very difficult to buy into the big picture. But if you extrapolate that across the company's operations and times it by the daily hours or, or the days in operation over the course of the year, it, it, it soon adds up. I completely agree. Well, that was such a great use case. Um, I think we're, we're almost towards the end of our session today, uh, Bradley. So I know we're just past the half an hour. Uh, so, so let's just recap for a moment. Um, so I, I think uh, to, to summarize your, your particular talking points today is the four aspects of maximizing ROI through optimized uh, frontline training. First, first tip, aligning training goals with business goals. I know that goes without saying, and there are challenges to that. I think you share some really interesting insights about how to do that by taking some of those KPIs out of isolation. Hmm. And of course, in order to do that, you have to deliver relevant and engaging content. The training itself has to be exceptionally uh, well done. It has to be very interactive. It can't be canned, as you mentioned. And, and the point that we're trying to do to bring this all together through the, through the lens of uh, a speak up experience is, is meeting employees where they are. Leverage the tools that they're already relying on for the other components of their employee experience to maximize the impact of that training itself. And that, of course, impacts the entire holistic view of the overall employee experience by, by driving confidence, competence, understanding the feeling that the organization actually cares about me. I think it's such a such a great tip today. No, I totally agree, Darren, and I'm so glad uh, Speak Up as a partner share so many values and views on the, the future of work and ultimately how we can help frontline workers uh, perform better, live happier lives, and ultimately help uh, the company's fortunes going forward as well. I, I couldn't agree more. We, we, we often lose sight, I think, when we're talking about these things, about all of the ROI to the business, but ultimately we're actually helping, uh, helping improve people's lives through, through better work, totally. and, and I completely believe that. So, well, I thought this was a great session. Uh, it looks like there's some nice chatter going on in, in, in the commentary. So um, I just want to thank you, Bradley, for joining us. Um, if anybody's interested in learning a bit more about, uh, about SpeakUp, you can get in touch with the usual channels. There's our website. Of course, you can please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Bradley, how about a bit, about a, bit of a shameless plug for Edumi? No, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Darren. It's As I said, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you on, on this particular webinar and sharing our story of our partnership as well. But as I mentioned earlier, Edgemi's mission is to enable everybody or help everybody be successful in their work. And we do that by delivering uh, relevant and engaging content in the flow of the work. So if your clients, if you're if you're a client thinking of using Speak Up or indeed you use Speak Up already today, please do not hesitate to get in contact with Edgemi because we'd love to see how we can support you and your frontline workforce as well. Great. Couldn't agree more. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thank you, Bradley. Great work. Thanks.